So welcome everyone to the first session of the Maine APA School Health Series in partnership with the Maine Department of Education. We are so excited that you're all here today. And um, Dr. Alyssa Goodwin, if you want to take over and introduce Laura Blaisdell, Dr. Laura Blaisdell, that'd be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, good afternoon. My name is Alyssa Goodwin. I'm a pediatrician in um, Topsom, Maine, and I'm the chair of the School Health Committee for the Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and as Emily just said, we are thrilled to be co-hosting um, this learning series um, with the um, Maine Association of School Nurses. It is my thrill um, to and, and privilege to introduce Dr. Laura Blaisdell. Um, Dr. Blaisdell is a pediatrician, a researcher, and an advocate. For 20 years, she's worked in camp medicine, serving as the medical director for Camp Winnebago and advising camps on a myriad of topics. I can only imagine, Laura. Um, she's currently the senior medical advisor for Serious Fun Children's Network and works clinically at the um, Maine Medical Center Pediatric Clinic. Dr. Blaisdale is the immediate past president of the Maine chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and is a founding member of the Maine Families for Vaccines, as well as the Safe Communities Coalition. In these, in this, these roles, she is a tireless advocate for vaccines and gun safety, among so many other issues facing our youth. Additionally, Dr. Blaisdale has served as the clinical site director for the National Children's Study as a chair, um, as chair of the Institutional Review Board, the IRB at Maine Med, as well as the Chief of Pediatrics at, at Intermed, and currently is a trustee for Mercy Hospital in Portland. She is also an associate professor at Tufts University School of Medicine, and she resides in South Portland, where it's apparently sunny today, um, with her two sons and husband, Andy. Um, Dr. Blaisdale, take it away. Wow, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm also just a person, a mom, you know, trying to get through the day, uh, trying to get kids to school and get get the garbage be out before the garbage truck comes by. So thank you so much for joining today. Um, I think we'll just hop right in because I I'd like to move fairly quickly through my slides. I there there I have 30, 30 plus ish slides, and then <clears throat> I'd like to leave time for the chat. I know um chat and questions. I'm not looking at the chat box right now, but people are. And so please make sure to ask, ask your questions and we will get to them um, uh, throughout this time. And if not, we'll get to them soon after. So um, just to review that none of the planners or speakers of this activity have financial relationships to disclose. So today we're going to work through um, the school versus child care uh, and, and post-secondary vaccine requirements. Uh, medical exemptions and issues surrounding medical exemptions, what are temporary medical exemptions, what's a delayed proof of vaccination. Um, we'll take a, a moment to talk about where people can get school vaccines, um, and then a little question and dialogue. <clears throat> so just to remind us that Maine's vaccine law that came into effect uh, in 2021 removed um, uh, phys re religious and uh, philosophical exemptions uh, from, the, from the regulations uh, for, as conditions of school entry. So previously religious and philosophical exemptions were uh, allowed. And after that, after the law passed, um, it, this, the law required uh, the DOE to adopt rules for, the stu for allowing a student who um, has covered by a, in, an IEP, which we'll talk about um, with philosophical or religious exemption to attend um, school as well. So as we're pulling away from the IEP um, requirement, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but as that had to be an IEP in place as of 2021. So we'll uh, clarify a little bit more about that later. Um, immunization requirements removes the, the, the law removed the verbiage of philosophical or, or religious belief exemptions from a multiple set of regulations outside of DOE. And here are some of the other um, regulations in which um, that the law ended up uh, changing the regulations. But um, the vaccine requirements um, listed in regulation are different depending on what institution you serve in. So there are different um, vaccine requirements for schools, for child care, for college and university, and for healthcare settings. So just to remind us what vaccines are needed for school. 
So in kindergarten, we need five Tdaps, uh, four if the fourth is given after the fourth birthday, four polio, uh, fourth dose given before the fourth birthday. Um, if it, it is before the fourth birthday, then an additional dosage would be appropriate after the fourth birthday, two MMR and two varicella. So four vaccines uh, required for school entry in kindergarten. In seventh grade, we add that booster of Tdap um, and a one meningococcal conjugate vaccine. Um, that is uh, uh, the MCV4. Um, and we, as we might, you might be aware, there is an additional meningococcal vaccine that's um, for meningococcal B that is not required. So we have two vaccines for meningococcal and we're requiring the MCV4. Then in 12th grade, um, we add this additional meningococcal um, booster as, as is recommended by, um, by the ACIP. Um, so I want to remind us that, that the requirements for school are different than the, the ACIP or CDC requirements. Uh, there are some vaccines that are in, um, that are, we would recommend um, addition, in addition to school vaccines, but it's not the entire uh, slate of vaccines that, that is required for school entry. So which, which are not included in school entry? Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, pneumococcal vaccine, HPV, Hib, rotavirus, influenza, COVID, RSV, dengue, none of these are included in the requirements for school entry. So there has, there were, there's been a lot of confusion and I think people are starting to become clear that um, some vaccines, this list of vaccines is not required for school entry. However, <clears throat> There are some that are required for childcare. So the ones that are highlighted here are the ones that are required for childcare in addition to the ones that are required for school entry. That's Hep A, Hep B, pneumococcal, and Hib. So this is the childcare vaccine uh, chart, uh, a requirement chart. So just remember that um, if you are working or if people reach out to you because they're asking, you know, what what's what vaccines are required, make sure that you're talking, that we're clarifying the difference between childcare and schools. And then post-secondary colleges and universities um, also are requiring two MMRs after the first birthday, um, one TD or TDAP given in the last 10 years. And just to remind us that colleges and universities often will require other vaccines as well. And this is particularly in practice where I'm seeing the men B come, the meningi meningococcal B coming in, uh, is that we are seeing universities and, and um, colleges require that additional meningitis vaccine in addition to the MCV4. So on meanaap.org, we've made this quick fact sheet um, to tell us what's required for kindergarten, seventh grade, twelfth grade, post high school, and childcare. So um, you can find that at meanaap.org. I want to talk um, a minute about proof uh, certification or proof of immunity. Um, that might be something that's coming up in in your um, world. Um, so, certificate of immunization is the, those um, sorts of things that that like the the vaccine card, right? That shows that a physician, nurse, public health official, or school provider has administered an immunizing agent. Um, and it it should specify the agent, the date on which it was administered, a lot a lot number. I think uh, it's important to be aware that um, there are um, certificates of immunization that might not look right. Um, and just to be aware of those that seem out of the ordinary. Um, there are different lines of, of practice that use things like nosodes or, or homeopathic immunization um, that uh, a certificate of immunity is given, but it's not um, it's not a vaccination certification certification of immunity. So just beware. Um, and then proof of immunity um, is are those things like titers, right? So a laboratory evidence that demonstrates immunity when having um, uh, had the disease or being vaccinated is likely. I'm going to say that again because proof of immunity is it can be very confusing. So this is laboratory evidence that we use when having had the disease or when having been vaccinated is highly likely. Right, it's not that what we do to do one shot and then take the take the um, titers the next day to prove that we had a booster from that titer. 
So think refugee health. For me, many of my patients are coming from other countries. They've completed vaccination series or they've had the disease. That's an appropriate place in which to use um, a, a immunity titer. Um, an immunity titer is, is not appropriate when you don't think that that person could have been immune um, from a vaccine or from having had the disease. So some, some other caveats, why um, is one dose not enough? Um, so a lot of times people say, well, I just wanna get one DTaP and then Dr. Blazer, will you please just grab immunity titers and we'll, we'll call it done. So why is one dose not enough? We know that um, some vaccines, particularly the inactivated vaccines, which we like to use because they have less, a better, uh, more acceptable side effect profile, that one dose does not engender immunity, right? So the second dose or third dose is required um, to complete immunity. The Hib vaccine is a good example of this. And um, this is especially true for live vaccines as well. Um, we know that immunity wanes. I think the COVID pandemic has taught us more than we ever wanted to know about vaccine <laughs> development and the limitations of vaccines, but we know that um, immunity wanes. This is a, a Tdap is a really good example of why we do that booster now. And we even know that Tdap does wane, um, the, the pertussis vaccination protection does wane. Um, and so you know that, that's why we use boosters. Um, and they, also we know that there are new variants. Um, so for flu and COVID, um, I think we know that if we got a titer for flu um, 10 years ago, that titer is not going to be protective for flu this year. So just some, some words of caution about, about when you would want to use an, um, a titer uh, and when um, one, one would um, prefer not to use a titer or when a titer does not um, con de uh, describe immunity as we as we hope it to be. So let's take a, a moment and talk about medical exemptions. So medical exemptions are the exemptions that are are left uh, in in our regulations in uh, for um, uh, school entry. Of course, you know in in our oath we these this is part of the reason for the law because some people can't get vaccinated and that's why we we um, do our community immunity to pr protect those who can't be vaccinated. So before the law, there was a list of, of indications for, um, uh, for medical exemptions. And while that was, um, it was nice to be able to point to a list and check it off, as we looked at developing the law, we realized that there were many changes that were happening um, to indications for vaccinations and, and medical exemptions for vaccinations that we wanted to keep it um, a little bit more fluid and, and um, uh, uh, allow, as we have in the law, an MDDO, an NP or a PA, who is licensed in Maine to determine that in their best professional judgment, immunization against one or the more one or more of the diseases may be medically inadvisable. So it's a it's a little um, broader in terms of its definition, and certainly um, there are people who like that that um, that space uh, to, um, and there are people who are looking for a little bit more. Um, guidance as to what that means. So let's just take a moment and look at um, what the ACIP um, uh, calls a contraindication to a vaccination. So the link um, to the ACIP site is here. It's a hot link on my computer. I welcome you to, you'll, we'll get it to you in the slides. But <clears throat> true contraindications are conditions that increase the risk for a serious adverse reaction. The most commonly listed uh, contraindication to, to vaccination is a severe allergic reaction to a previous vaccine or vaccine component, right? So that makes sense. You've had an allergic reaction, we're not gonna give that to you again. Other specific contraindication examples could be live vaccines. Um, we know that live vaccines like MMR, varicella, rota, or intranasal flu should not be given to severely immunized individuals. Uh, they shouldn't be given, uh, particularly the rotavirus uh, vaccine should not be given to those who have a history of intussusception. Uh, and we know that live attenuated viruses generally we don't give to pregnant women because of a theory theoretical risk to the, to the fetus. Um, so we generally don't use live vaccines in, um, in those cases. So, some, so th there's some examples. In addition, like Tdap um, has some uh, ha had so, uh, some de um, descriptions of encephalopathy. Encephalopathy. Ah, can't speak today. Need some water. 
uh, encephalopathy within seven days um, after administration. Uh, and so, of course, if that had happened, that we would we would not advise an additional dose of, of Tdap be given or DTAP be given to that individual. But for the most part, we're living in the world of precautions, right? So, so just to summarize the contraindications, it's kind of, you know, those allergic reactions, um, having a, a, a live vaccine or having some really bad adverse event within, you know, a few days after, um, after receipt of a vaccine. Precautions is the other term that ACIP talks about. These are conditions that might increase the risk for serious adverse reaction. They might cause diagnostic confusion. So let's say you were getting, your child was getting, um, uh, laboratories done in the day after a child, a well child check, I might decide not to give them a vaccination that could, could cause diagnostic confusion in the, in the next day. Or, um, that, uh, a contraindication is, um, uh, a, a condition that might compromise the ability of the vaccine to produce immunity. So if you had somebody say on, on high dose steroids that they weren't going to necessarily mount a good immune response, one might wait until after that, um, that dosage of steroids goes down and then decide to vaccinate after that time. Um, a vaccine might be indicated even in, in the presence of a precaution if the benefit outweighs the risk. So let's get into some examples. So the most common one that we see in pediatrics is acute or severe illness with a fever, right? So the kid comes in with a cold, uh, they have you know, a 101 fever, can they get their vaccine today? That is a potential time when a provider might say, you know what, can you guys come back next week? Is that available to you? Um, we'll just do that when they're feeling better. However, because it's a precaution, if they were saying, actually, we're I'm here to get my MMR because we're going out of the country in three days, you might decide that it is safe uh, to give that vaccine at that time because um, the benefit outweighs the risk. Um, and just to remind individuals that there's safety and e efficacy of vaccination in mild illness has been established. So it's it's somewhat common practice now if you have a sniffle that we still go ahead with the vaccination at that well child check in conjunction with the parent decision making. Um, so um, another example of precaution is admi administering MMR to a person with passive immunity to measles from a blood transfusion um, up to seven months prior. So what does all that mumbo jumbo mean? Let's say you had um, a kid with Kawasaki's disease. They were treated with a treatment called IVIG, which is a blood product. That is a child who shouldn't get a live vaccine um, uh, for the next seven months because the blood product uh, contains anti-measles related vac um, uh, antibodies, which would ineffective make the yield the vaccine to be ineffective. Um, another reason to not give a vaccine is because you have current, recurrent, uh, recent or upcoming anesthesia, surgery, or hospitalization. It's not necessarily a contraindication, but perhaps it's not the time to, um, you know, have any sort of side effects um, from, from the vaccine. Um, I think uh, we talk a, a lot about the seizure risk in the MMRV vaccine. Um, personal or family history of seizures is a precaution for the MMRV vaccine. Um, we know that we can give the MMR vaccine and the varicella vaccine separately. And interestingly, the studies that, that changed our practice of how we give MMR and varicella were this study that showed that um, in younger children, um, if we gave them together in the pentavalent, the, the, the quad pro quad MMRV, um, there was an increased risk of febrile seizures, um, benign seizures that are self-limited and have no uh, long-term sequelae. So we oftentimes will, we now give those two vaccines separated. Um, even if you give those vaccines separated at the same, on the same day, we see that risk of febrile seizures go down. So um, just to know that if you have a personal or family history of seizures, um, just to make sure to, to ask um, to, that that's a potential precaution. All right, so we have contraindications, we have precautions, and then let's talk about conditions incorrectly perceived as a precaution or a contraindication. Acute illness without fever, with or without fever, current antibiotics, being preterm, 
having a recent exposure to infectious disease, receiving allergen immunotherapy, having a history of a penicillin allergy, having a history of Guillain-Barre syndrome, asterisk, unless it was less than six weeks after an influenza vaccine. So if it was, if a person has Guillain-Barre syndrome and you said, did you receive a flu vaccine? And, and did, is that why they thought you had Guillain-Barre? And they said, no, it was completely random. That is a not, it's in, in, incorrectly perceived as a, as a precaution or contraindication. Um, flu, um, having a severe, non-severe allergy to latex or egg is not a contraindication to flu vaccines. Having a positive P TB test is not a, an indi a contraindication to MMR. Neither is breastfeeding. Neither is having an immunodeficient member uh, in the household or having uh, somebody living with somebody who's asymptomatic or mildly asymptomatic with HIV. When we turn to Tdap or Dtap, um, having a fever um, prior to the vaccination is not a contraindication. Neither is having a seizure less than three days after the uh, Dtap or D, um, Tdap dose. Um, and then having a family history of seizures or, or SIDS is also not a contraindication um, for Dtap. So um, some things that have come up in the past and have been cleared um, by our governing bodies as, as not um, precautions or contraindications. Oh, sorry, uh, having a stable neurologic condition um, such as CP, well-controlled seizures or developmental delay, also not a reason um, to avoid vaccination for DTAP. So, You've seen a patient or you you have uh, have determined that they have a medical exemption or they they you have determined in your best judgment that um, a, a child should not be getting the vaccines today. What should you do? How should you document it? So the ACIP, the MMA, the Maine Osteopathic Association um, got together and created this form which mirrors the ACIP contraindications so that you can you can go ahead and download this form and check um, a, a DTAP uh, vaccine that it's a temporary uh, exemption um, and we're, we'll talk about why that would be um, or a permanent exemption. So if it's a contraindication, you might just check permanent and then circle which of the two contraindications you're um, giving a medical exemption for. The precautions, um, you might decide that that's temporary. Another reason why I use temporary medical exemptions is when I'm doing a catch-up schedule. Um, and uh, we'll talk a lot more about catch-up schedules in a couple of slides. So um, at the bottom here, um, it just asks you to attest with your name and your practice name and your signature. So an easy way um, to either demonstrate to parents what you're using um, for contraindications or um, an, an, an easy way to document that as well. So let's talk about catch-up schedules for a minute. Um, so catch-up schedules are used when somebody comes in and, and they're um, behind um, on vaccines. So we separate our catch-up schedules into two groups, either the four to six month catch-up schedule, which is the top of this table two in the CDC um, catch-up immunization schedule, or seven to 19 years, which is the bottom. Some vaccines have different number of doses at, at, a, at a higher age. And if it, um, it, and it but and it really is the time from dose to dose that de generates a temporary medical exemption. So what I mean is that if you, if I Laura had never had MMR today, and I got MM, MMR today, I couldn't get another vaccine tomorrow, right? So currently, I have I have I am up to date, and um, generally I've recommended to individuals and would love to hear from this um, group. Um, that that would be a temporary medical exemption for the four weeks that it takes for me to come back to get my second dose. So um, when we think about catch-up schedules, um, when we, this is, uh, let's start with Tdap or Dtap, right? This is the hardest, the longest to, to catch up if you, one comes in with zero doses. Um, you can see that here at the bottom, the minimum age for dose one is six weeks. And then you have these columns, right? The time from dose one to dose two, the time from dose two to dose three, the time from dose three to dose four, the time from dose four to dose five. So 
if somebody was Johnny on the spot and got their vaccines, um, they were a five-year-old who got their DTaP vaccines straight through. Um, every time they were available for the next dose, they got it that day. It would take 13 months to get this individual completely caught up um, to on, on vaccination. Um, similarly, <clears throat> if we look at polio, um, this is the vaccine schedule, uh, catch-up schedule for polio. The catch-up time for polio is either eight or seven months, depending on when they got their first dose, right? So this is oftentimes what um, I'm faced with, um, with a lot of our, our immigrants and refugees who say that they've been vaccinated, but because of the circumstances of their, their um, journey to the U.S., they've lost their vaccine records. Um, and so we begin again. Um, and so the polio is the second longest uh, vaccine to catch up in terms of time. The good news is MMR and varicella, of which you need two to enter school in Maine, um, that's a catch-up time of one month, right? If there is, you get an MMRV today, you can get another MMRV in one month, and then you're done. So um, this catch-up schedule um, for uh, the older kids is here, and I think it, it's just it's pointing out a couple of things. I don't know if I have a pop-up. No, a couple of things that I wanted to point out here is that we don't give um, Haemophilus influenza B in the catch-up schedule. Um, for the six, seven to 18 years. Why? Because they're outside of the risk of it becoming a serious condition for them. Hib is a, is a, a very serious condition in um, babies, uh, and we have not decided that we need Hib um, vaccination in our older population to um, eradicate Hib from, from the, the community. The other um, vaccine that you see that's not on here is pneumococcal. Right, and um, once you become seven, um, there isn't a catch-up schedule for pneumococcal. Um, of course, we know that there are certain diseases like sickle cell or other um, functional asplenia um, that we would we would want to have pneumococcal disease uh, vaccinated against. So I said Tdap's the hardest, right? The hardest, the longest. Um, luckily, the CDC has given us a lovely help guide. <laughs> I think Tdap is also um, confusing because it's Dtap, it's Td, it's T Tdap, right? So there's a lot of different um, vaccine pro products that we use, um, and so this helpful guide um, that you can find at this website um, link that CDC.gov website is kind of like the, a choose your own adventure book, right? So you can say, okay, this person is eight years. They've had one dose of something that had TD, Tdap in it. And so, and it's um, the first dose was given when they were younger than 12 months. And so what do we do next, right? So this is kind of a helpful, helpful guide um, when you're trying to figure out um, Tdap. Uh, the only, there is another helpful guide for Hib. And from um, uh, pneumococcal, and I've certainly given the CDC great feedback about um, polio as well, that we would like a catch-up guide for that. So I'm just going to wrap up this section, and then we're going to talk about um, uh, uh, some IEPs and um, then delayed proof of vaccination. Um, but I just wanted to wrap up this section by doing a case. Okay, so like, we'll take a moment here. Okay, so a five-year-old walks in, they have no vaccines. What do we do to get them ready for kindergarten, right? Where do you start? <laughs> so I'll give you a minute for those of us who, who process, need a moment to process. So this is how I would choose this adventure, right? If as long as we had um, consent and, and, and parental um, agreement. So today I would give this kid their first T DTAP, their first IPV, and their first MMR and varicella. And I would give that together, MMRV, right? So then I would have them come back in four weeks so that I could do that second DTAP, the second IPV, and the second MMR varicella together. Right. Then four weeks after that, I would have them come back and get the third DTAP. And six months after that, they would get their third IPV. And that would be their final dose because they were greater than four when they got their um, their second dose was six months ago. So they were greater than four, second month, six seconds. So they're done. Now they're done with MMR, varicella, and IPV after six months. 
right? And then six months after that, I would give them their fourth DTAP. And again, that's their final dose, right? Because they are four years. So I hope this is helpful and illustrative of like kind of how we how we can approach um, getting somebody maximally vaccinated in the shortest amount of time. But it also might be helpful to um, our school nurse colleagues who are thinking, okay, when when is this child going to get the next dose, or when are they due for their next dose? Um, so hopefully that's that's helpful in kind of thinking about how we think about it. Um, I just want to take a moment to 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 clarify the IEP statement that I said earlier. When we made the law, we um, there was some um, uh, compromises that were made uh, so that a student with an IEP, an individualized education plan, on or before September first, twenty twenty one. Um, could um, uh, remain um, unvaccinated due to a philosophical or religious vaccination. Why? It has no medical grounding, right? We, we know that having an IEP doesn't put you at an in increased risk of having a contraindication to vaccination, but this was an agreement that was made in, in, in making the law. Hopefully now we're not seeing as many of these um, because um, most of, you know, it's 2021, 2022, 23, we've started to see um, these come forward but uh, and be dealt with, but um, just wanted to make sure that you knew that there was a form to fill out um, and there there is a process um, if if you're interested in, in, in if it does come up. The last thing I wanna talk about, um, and then I have two more slides. Oh, good, and that leaves a lot of time for chatting. Um, uh, so I want to talk a minute about um, some people have heard of the McKinney Vento students um, or the McKinney Vento law, and I want to kind of give some context for what that is. So we know I'm laughing because I'm telling I'm telling school nurses that sometimes students do arrive to school without their vaccination records, right? <laughs> I'm sure that never happens, right? So we don't we know that we want to keep those children in school, right? And in particularly people who are new Mainers, um, as I mentioned, you know the the process of getting from a home country to the U.S. in the middle of an, a refugee or asylee reason for leaving your country can mean that you lose your vaccination records. So we don't want those kids to be not in school. Similarly, we don't want a class of students called McKenny Vento students to not be in school because they can't find their vaccination records. These are students who are living in emergency or transitional housing. They're living in motels, hotels, or campgrounds. They're sharing households um, due to economic hardship. They're living in cars, parks, or other, park, other public spaces. And there are other um, situations in which uh, students might not have their vaccine records. We want these kids to be able to enroll in school on day one. We'll sort out the paperwork later, right? That's what the McKinney-Vento law is about. So some students, these students are protected from exclusion from school if they cannot provide proof of vaccination at the start of school. It is a protection based on their, their inability to find their vaccine records at that moment and not that they don't have it, that they don't need or won't ever get vaccinated, right? So um, you can, schools can exclude the student after a period of time if they don't demonstrate proof of vaccination or if there's no progress towards vaccine compliance, right? So basically what you're doing is saying, come in, we're gonna sort it out. And oftentimes like, you know, with my, uh, a lot of my refugees' parents, I'll, they'll WhatsApp somebody at home and sure enough, they, they dug out the vaccine records out of a box someplace. And then we're able to move on um, and, and um, get them off of the kind of uh, exemption list. But just wanna clarify um, that this delayed proof of vaccination does not mean that somebody has not been vaccinated, right? Last last two slides here. Um, <clears throat> where can people get vaccines? Um, it's it breaks my heart when people say, "Oh, I, I I don't have any access to vaccines." I'm telling you, like you can call my office any day, <laughs> and I'll 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 be happy to get people in to get them vaccinated. So providers' office should providers. If you're on the call, you should really prioritize school required vaccines at all appointments. Um, they're coming in for Oshkosh Slaughter. They're coming in because they need their sports physical. They're coming in because 
Um, they're coming in for their pre-winter asthma tune-up. These should be all times to be looking at required vaccinations for school appointments or for, for school attendance. Because remember that five-year-old who didn't have vaccines and how we need to kind of keep hitting them multiple times, um, uh, uh, keep not hitting them, but keep um, keeping up with their vaccines multiple times. And it's hard. It's hard in a busy practice to do that. So some best practices in, that I use in my office to help keep me on my game is I use exemption reports. So every once in a while, I'll run an exemption report reminding myself of who is behind on school vaccines in my clinic. Um, and I'll use uh, flu clinics or RN visits ubiquitously for other vaccines as well, right? They, a kid can come in and see, um, you take an RN visit uh, and, and not necessarily have to see me and keep them um, up to speed. I also want to, um, I'll say this again on the next slide, but cons consider giving a backdoor connection to your school nurses to ease communication and facilitate va vaccination. It's so much easier when Tammy can be like, hey, Laura, I have this kid in your clinic. Can you please get them a Tdap? And I say, yeah, Tammy, I'll get them right in, right? Easy, done. Um, and so um, consider um, sharing a back, a back room, a back number uh, to school RNs. Um, we know that pharmacies are giving vaccines. So what's the scoop on pharmacies giving vaccines? Um, COVID and flu um, for greater than three years of age can be given without a prescription at all pharmacies. All other vaccines greater than three years of age require a prescription. Okay, so this is a call to Alyssa. Hey, Alyssa, my kid needs um, meningitis. I can't come in. Can you send a prescription for that to CVS on Water Street so that I can get it there? She says, sure. So she sends through, she, Alyssa sends through prescriptions to the CVS all the time. She says, okay. So that's not, not, it's just that extra step of calling a provider and getting a prescription. Um, additionally, the pharmacy has to be enrolled in the vaccine for children's or main immunization program. Um, they can do that at no cost. <clears throat> Otherwise that, that prescription that Alyssa called in for my child will be billed to my insurance. Um, and there is a, a hyperlink here of pharmacies that are providing COVID. Um, so that if you're looking for, for a COVID vaccine site that you can get there. I am so excited about our school-based health systems, our school-based health centers. Um, I can't even, I, I get teary-eyed when I think of how much we accomplish in those centers. And, and so thank you to the providers, if you're on the call, um, who are part of school-based health centers. Um, uh, I had emailed some, some of our friends at the state and they were able to share that Linda Parker as a public health nurse can help, um, organize clinics, uh, at your school. Um, so please feel free to, to reach out to Linda Parker at maine.gov and, um, our school-based clinics are, um, uh, are, most of them do have vaccines on site, um, for the, for the school required vaccines. So that's another place that people can go and, and check. Lastly, a word about communication, and then I'm going to be quiet and, and take questions. Um, I wanted, uh, Tammy uh, reminded me in our, in our conversation about the HIPAA privacy rule, uh, that this allows healthcare providers to disclose PHI to students, school nurses, physicians, and other healthcare providers for treatment purposes without the authorization of a student or student parents. So uh, just to remember um, that we we really best practice is to get a release of information um, to talk to the school about a lot of things um, that certainly puts it into um, uh, helps you know make sure that the the discussion is is uh, the parents are aware. However, if somebody is there and they say, "My mom said I could get a Tdap today at school," and the nurse calls me and says, "Is that okay? Do, can they get a Tdap?" and I, I say, "From their vaccine records, they are due for a Tdap." Um, that is something we can share. Um, I wanted to also um, talk about who and how long is an exemption for. Um, again, really plugging those backdoor connections with your local provider's offices. I can tell you from Alyssa uh, and, and my perspective, we are more than happy to give you a connection with us. Uh, we just haven't thought about it, right? We, we, so we don't want you to go into the, the press one if you're, <laughs> press two if you're, we want you to be able to get to our offices very quickly. Um, and then, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, Tammy and I had a great discussion about um, the school nurse process of determining um, who's, who's, um, uh, who needs a catch up uh, vaccine, who's delayed, um, and, and how often we check. Hopefully that um, 
that example that I gave you of the five-year-old made you curious about whether or not a student could be um, uh, due for another vaccine. I know that we check every September, but it's possible that if we checked more often, we could move that kid along that 13 months of um, time to Tdap a little bit sooner. So we can work in partnership. Um, and so considering um, checking and, and perhaps rechecking uh, those at exemption list, maybe at the first of the year, I, I, I say these things with such, such shame because I know what school nurses, uh, how busy your schedules are. So I say that with, you know, just like, I'll run the exemption list for you. Um, uh, again, uh, if you need, if you need to figure out what a kid's vaccination needs are, those backdoor connections, and I can't say enough about the main AAP school health committee, Dr. Goodwin, uh, Emily running this committee, it's fantastic. Um, and, uh, so if you are, if this is a passion project for you, please consider joining the public health committee and sorry, Emily, I added your email in there <laughs> for, for people to email you. I'm going to stop, pass it back to you, Alyssa, and see if what questions or comments people have. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Laura. You know, I've been working with you on vaccine requirements and vaccine everything for a very long time, and I never fail to learn something new from you when I hear you talk. So, um, and so, you know, as the chair of the school health committee, but also as the school physician for my local district, conversations around these issues, I feel like we have them every month and we have for years prior to the law going into effect. And now here we are on the third fall where the law has been in effect and yet still so much confusion. So there were a couple of questions I was thinking about based on the conversations I've had and they kind of jive with what I'm seeing in the chat. Um, so I see a couple of questions in the chat that kind of go to that exemption piece. Um, and so one, sort of two sides to this question. One from Angie um, is what do you do? And, and again, I, I'm coming from the provider side, but I also, again, work closely with my school nurses so I can feel the, the pain on both sides of this. What do you do with a parent who insists on a much slower administration rate than what is advisable based on the minimum? So a parent who comes in and is like super behind on vaccines and says, I'm only going to get one a year or I'm only going to get one every six months. And I am I can certainly talk to how I handle that. I'd be interested in how you handle those um, parents who really are, you know, sort of getting caught up, but doing it on a very creative timeline. So it's a loaded it's, question, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, it's a, it's not uncommon, right? Yeah. It's, a very, yeah. it's a very uh, salient and point, uh, pertinent question. Um, you know, I, I have such compassion for parents who are trying to make decisions in this space. Um, yeah. And so I, I want to start from a place of compassion mm -hmm. um, and um, really thank parents for trusting me for even giving them one vaccine, right? Um, in, in the world that we live with this mis and disinformation, it can be almost paralyzing to make yeah. these decisions. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, um, you know, we have a school to protect and we have a law to enforce. Um, as a provider, it's not my job to enforce the law. It's my job to work with individuals to provide maximal opportunity to adhere to the law. Um, and so I do feel like when you feel like there are people who are milking the system of trying to catch up, um, um, to, you know, have a good, have a conversation and, and Tammy, this is kind of in, in your world, but to have a conversation with the parents about when's, when's the intent to finish, um, and, um, and kind of now maybe, um, with a couple of these slides that we can talk about, like the way that you're choosing to do this means that they'll be in 10th grade <laughs> by the time we do this, if we do once a year, right? So um, that's that's probably not going to be acceptable. Can we figure out a way that we can move this along a little bit? Um, I, I I don't know the system for support. Tammy, you're probably the first stop for system of support in these questions, um, and maybe I'll pass it to you. Um, you know, so I guess to summarize my answer as a provider, my job is to move parents along in in as comfort in a, in as comfortable but as a, a expedient a way as we can to protect their child, right? A school nurse and a school representative has a different um, focus, which is to protect the school's health and to uphold the law. Right, that's part of part of what um, their their role is. And so, I'd be interested, Tammy, what you would say um, to that um, from your perspective. 
Yeah, I would I would completely agree with you. Um, our, we we do want to uh, work with the parents and the families um, to make sure that they get the vaccines that they need uh, following the best schedule that's recommended as soon as possible. Uh, we do realize that sometimes there are some um, differences in what families are agreeable to and comfortable with. Um, however, it has to be a reasonable plan. It, it can't be a 10 year plan that never happens. So um, following the CDC a ASAP re recommendations as closely as possible um, while still trying to work with the families um, to meet the needs of the families and the students, I think yeah. it's, yeah. And I would just follow that um, by saying a couple of things. I think this really highlights the connection between school nurses and the medical homes that support your districts. Um, one of the things I really think is important for school nurses to hear and believe, and I think some of you do and some of you don't, just based on conversations I've had, is that recognizing that as a school nurse, you are a provider. And so being in, in not only entitled, but like you are probably the most important provider we're gonna hear from. So pressing whatever the number that says, if you're a provider, press X. Um, I think again, like every practice is a little different. And so sometimes being able to kind of crack that nut is tricky, but I think that just, again, knowing that you are a provider and press number one or whatever it is. Um, I also think in my, um, my practice often, you know, in our district, we really use um, and basically require that AAP exemption form. So I don't have to, I don't fill out those forms based on parents' wishes. I fill them out based on what the science is. So I'm going to give somebody a temporary exemption for that one month between their first and second DTAP. I'm not going to give them a year exemption. And so I feel like I see a question sort of down lower about sort of what is our responsibility as providers. Again, I think that this is where having those connections to your medical homes and also knowing who your school health advisors are. Again, I serve as the school health advisor for the Brunswick district. So, you know, I, I sort of talk through these situations, even if I'm not the PCP, obviously we're not talking about HIPAA protected information if I'm not the primary care, but I can kind of talk through and guide or, you know, give information about how our nurses might address this. And there have been times where I have, you know, reached out to, groups sort of providing that information of like, hey, this is what we're doing. And so please do this. So, but I think that's where that connection is really, um, really important. Um, so, and then I think some, some specifics around, we had talked about that the exemption requirement is that it's a main licensed MDDOPANP. And I, I see a note um, from one of our um, nurses who's on the in York County. And so working with people whose pe like primary care doc is not in Maine. And so I think before the um, the meeting started, we had sort of talked about, so I don't know if Laura or you or um, Tammy want to just sort of talk about those sort of one-off situations where, um, you know, somebody's medical home is not in Maine and how that might be different from somebody who goes searching on the internet for vaccine exemption specialist and gets a letter written out of someplace in Texas. So like those, you know, just how that, how those two things might be different. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think a reasonable driving distance from a person's home address is a, is a provider who, who seems reasonable. I think Tammy, you're, you're using, you're not having the death of common sense when we have this main licensed provider. Um, and so, yes, uh, you know, if they're in Texas, it's a little different. Um, so, and there are, um, <clears throat> we know uh, there are plenty of individuals who will sell a medical exemption online um, or elsewhere. So just be aware that this is an industry now. Um, and so that's why that's what we're looking for. We're looking for those individuals who are who have made an industry out of medical exemptions. We're, we're not looking for the individual who lives in, in New Hampshire <laughs> or North Conway, right? We're, we're looking for those individuals who are truly not um, caring for that child. And I just want to say, um, uh, in re in in response to the 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 kind of the slow vaccinators, you guys are doing an incredible job. I mean, if you look at Maine's vaccine rates, I I can't even like it. It, it is so astounding the job that we are doing as a community in our schools. So just congratulations to take a moment on those days when you feel really like beaten down. 
<laughs> and that it's difficult and the job is hard. We're doing such a great job. Our vaccination rates are incredible. Yep, absolutely. I was going to just say with um, those exemptions, sometimes if you, I, we recently had a, a situation in the Brunswick community where a parent provided a letter that looked really, really scary. It looked like somebody was going to go to jail if they didn't give the, it like referenced all of this big, like medical legalese. And then a quick Google search led me to discover that this was again, sort of a medical exemption factory. So sometimes a quick Google, or if it's a name you've never seen associated with a patient, again, I think sort of that, you know, thinking about again, who has been taking care of this kid. And if they all of a sudden switch to somebody who you're getting a lot of exemptions from, you know, that might be a worth a conversation with, um, with Tammy or myself. And then, um, but I'm going to refer you to refer you to Tammy. So, um, and then there are two more questions about, well, actually, since we're talking about exemptions, um, we have a question about, you know, what, and I think you kind of address this, um, Laura, but just for, um, a nurse who received a medical exemption for behavioral reasons. And so, you know, just sort of when we get into those sort of potentially more squishy spaces, um, you know, how do we sort of navigate that from the school side, I think, or the school nurse side? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it really, um, it's, it's important to understand, you know, what is that behavioral reason? So I, I have kids who are um, developmentally delayed for some reason, and vaccination is very traumatic for them. So I might wait until they get a dental cleaning under anesthesia, or I might wait until they um, are getting a surgery and then it, coordinate with the surgeons and the parents to say, let's just get all their vaccinations done while they're while they're under anesthesia. So <clears throat> that's quite different than my kid has ADHD and that's a contraindication to being vaccinated with MMR. That's that's um, would that would be to me a, a non uh, a, a medical exemption that you might want to bring attention to your school physician or to the DO, DOE. Um, so, so yes, um, seeking some further clarifications, there are behavioral reasons. Um, but, um, a, you know, uh, another example <clears throat> is a, you know, 14 year old who's needle phobic, right? Um, so that's a behavior. Uh, it's not necessarily a medical exemption. And it's a behavior that we can manage. Um, we have ways, uh, one, to help children move through needle phobia and if necessary, um, using a little pre-medication prior to, to vaccination. So that's what, another one of those ones that I would push back on and say, this is not a true um, medical exemption and call that back to line number and say, hey, Alyssa, you know, my my kid in school won't, is so scared, what can we do? And to do a little brainstorming about that. So. There are behavioral ones that I would call a medical exemption. The kid who is waiting for surgery, I'd probably give a medical exemption for three months until a surgery. There are others that I would say um, uh, pushing back just a little bit, but you know, using using your school providers and and Tammy to to help suss that out. Yeah, I think that's important to also you know based on sort of what I think I'm reading in the question that that would really be more of a temporary exemption with working towards a plan. I think that's also a really important time to go back to making sure that we're prioritizing those um, school required vaccines or those seasonal vaccines that are really more impactful in the moment. Um, and, you know, certainly I have many of my patients have needle phobia and anxiety, and there are many traumatic things that I do that I've worked really hard in my systems to know there are some kids who cannot get a vaccine at a checkup. So I might do a vaccine at a separate visit or they can't do a clinic. And so again, I think that's where the communication piece um, is really going to be important. And sometimes it does mean advocating, especially in some of the larger health systems that just are, you know, sort of setting things up in a way that may not work for our pediatric patients. Um, but again, I think that's why the communication piece is so helpful. Um, since I have a private practice, anybody who needs a vaccine, who struggles to get a vaccine, like send them to me. I have my sleeping dog over here. I have my like vaccine ninja who works with me. So like, just send me all your trickiest kids. Like, I love that. Um, but, but truly just knowing that there are ways that we vaccinate, um, and sometimes it's doing teamwork. Sometimes again, it is doing some pre-medication or some, you know, relaxation or using shop lockers or going to their car, right? There's so many ways that we can be creative. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat. I could talk about that stuff all day long. So I love doing that. 
Um, and then just before we run out of time, because I know we're getting to the, the end of our hour, um, there is a question around when you would use titers um, versus just restarting um, the vaccine. So for those who maybe have lost their vaccine records and are facing an entire revaccination, what sort of decision making would you use to actually go back and do titers versus just kind of starting from scratch? Great question. So I think any school age kid, I probably would think about using titers in that refugee situation or asylee situation. Why? Because there's a really good chance that that kid had two MMRs or had two varicellas or was completely vaccinated, right? That's the likelihood of them being previously vaccinated is quite high at five, right? I don't, I, I will have had many passionate discussions about doing titers on a new immigrant who is two. <laughs> so if I do an MMR varicella titer on a two-year-old who is up to date on her vaccination, she's going to come across as having an, a titer that is a proof of immunity because she got her MMR at one, <laughs> right? But that doesn't mean that she doesn't need her second titer, right? It doesn't mean that that I'm going to send her to school at kindergarten and say, she's good. She doesn't need her second MMR, right? So I think uh, hopefully that kind of explains a little bit like the school age kids who have no proof of no are new to Maine. I'm highly suspicious that they are been vaccinated prior to coming. Um, those are the kids that that I would um, consider doing uh, titers now, knowing that we don't have titers for every vaccine, right? So um, sometimes it's it's better just to, it's easier just to do the 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 um, the two MMRs or, or things. We do have titers for MMR. We do have titers for chickenpox, but um, a little bit more difficult to find them for uh, Tdap and polio. Yeah, I think that really highlights um, what Tammy just put in the chat, which is, I know when I have kids that are off schedule, um, I I 1000% triple check, quadruple check, like I'm always checking the catch up vaccine schedule, because if I don't, I will, I tell people like, I will guarantee to mess it up. And so having that somewhere, um, as you are, you know, sort of checking those vaccine records as they come in, because um up to date can look really different. And so if you're not familiar or constantly looking at those catch-up schedules, it can get really messy. So I think having those um, catch-up schedules, either there is a great um, CDC vaccine app, there's the CDC, you can have it, you know, it's it's available. So just knowing that. Um, Alyssa, can I quickly grab the yeah. question from Jasmine and Dr. Keyport? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so we all are responsible. This is a team effort, right? And so this is this is what this is one of the reasons we wanted to have this talk is because right now um, we we know that our school nurses are are busy. They're trying to get you know their their initial assessment of vaccination status for all kids, and then do their reporting, and then you know they are looking at our medical exemptions. Uh, and sometimes it, it is a bit of time before they can look at another exemption report and realize who's still not caught up yet, right? So this is a this is a this is the teamwork makes the dream work situation in the sense that um, you know when we send a kid off uh, without a, 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 a vaccination that occurs at that moment, that it is it is it, we should all consider it our own responsibility, whether it be a nurse who said, great, you have an exemption, we'll see you in six months, or whether it be me as a provider. I do recommend running monthly exemption reports and having somebody checking them. Um, and additionally, um, uh, um, I have been working with the provider's offices, uh, sorry, the Portland Public Schools, uh, to have them run exemption reports and giving those to um, to uh, the the provider's offices that the, of where the schools are. So it's a two way street, right? As and we're so we're trialing, we're beta testing some ways, uh, checks in the year uh, to ensure that we're moving along. But if if people want to be involved in in those projects, please like sh give us a shout out. Those are the sorts of thoughts about how we can um, continue to to improve our vaccine rates and continue to improve the process that we want to know from from the people on the call. Right. So it's four thirty. So in the interest of time, we're going to wrap up. But if you have any other questions, please reach out to any of us, and we can get your question answered. Thank you so much again, Laura. This was absolutely excellent. Thank you everyone for being here. This was a great turnout. We really appreciate it. Thanks you will so all receive. <laughs> What's that? 
I just want to thank everyone on the call. You guys are a wonderful team to work with. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, you will all receive just a post-session evaluation. So that's how you'll receive your certificate um, within 10 days. And then I will also send you the PDF slides so you can have them as a resource. Um, so again, thank you so much. Please join us next month on November 5th for a presentation by Dr. Brian Youth and Jessica Anderson on school absences as a risk factor. So have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you.